Mistakes happen. That's true of all things in life, including living things. And sometimes those mistakes happen when we're trying to make more DNA. These mistakes are referred to as mutations, and that's what we're going to talk about in this video. So stay tuned. Hi, and thanks for tuning in. Today we're going to be talking about mutations. Quite simply, mutations are changes in genomic information. In other words, they're changes in the DNA sequences that encode the genetic information of an individual. Now, mutations can come from different sources. There are induced mutations. These are mutations that are typically caused by external forces. So this could be exposure to chemical mutagens or exposures to different types of radiation like UV or X-rays. There are also spontaneous mutations, and spontaneous mutations arise through errors during DNA replication, typically during cell division. Regardless of the source of the mutation, mutations can be passed down from generation to generation. They are the engines of evolution. They provide different versions of genes, which change certain proteins and can impact the survival of individuals. And that is what leads to adaptation, and it leads to changes in species. But we'll talk about more of that down the road uh, in this video. But first, we have to think about what types of mutations can actually be passed down. It turns out if you're a unicellular organism, any mutation you acquire, whether it's spontaneous or induced, is going to be passed down to the next generation because you divide through binary fission, essentially copying what's ever in your genome and passing it on to your offspring. On the other hand, if you're a multicellular sexually reproducing organism like humans, for example, the only way these mutations can be passed down from one generation to the next is if they occur in a specialized sex cell called a gamete. So in humans, that's the sperm and the egg. And as well as most sexually reproducing organisms, it's the sperm or the egg. The mutation has to occur in one of those two cells in order to make it on to the next generation. That's a process called vertical gene transfer. So just because we have a mutation doesn't make it a bad thing. Now, mutations generally are what we typically call evolutionarily neutral. In other words, they don't impact the survival or reproduction of the individual who possesses them. And we'll talk about why that is in just a minute. However, some mutations are harmful and other ones are beneficial. The harmful and the beneficial ones are the ones that largely impact the evolution of a species. Harmful ones tend to be called out of a population, while beneficial ones tend to accumulate. But what do mutations typically look like? Well, if we're talking about the origin of mutations, mutations come from the DNA. Mutations are changes in the DNA sequence of a particular organism's genome. Now, the first type of mutation that we'll talk about that's quite common is called a point mutation. So if we are examining a point mutation, uh, what you will notice is that we are going to input one of the wrong nucleotides. This could be uh, due to a mutation triggered by an external exposure that causes DNA repair to put in the wrong nucleotide when trying to repair the DNA, or it could simply be because DNA, or DNA polymerase made an error when replicating that particular part of the chromosome. Either way, we end up with a nucleotide that's not supposed to be there, which causes it to form an improper base pair. So for example, if there was a G on this strand, there should be a C opposite it. Well, if we made a mistake and we put an A in there instead of a G, now we're gonna have an AT base pair, with the complementary strand. Either way, we've now changed the DNA sequence that encodes that particular part of the genome. Another common type of mutation is called an insertion. And insertions simply happen when we insert one or more nucleotides into the sequence that aren't supposed to be there. So maybe we had one T, but now we have two Ts. Or maybe we had a T and then we had an, an, an A next to it, and now we have a T and then a G and then an A. So an insertion means we're just going to be adding nucleotides into the DNA strand. The opposite of that, of course, is a deletion. Sometimes errors happen where we delete nucleotides and we shorten the chromosome slightly by one or more nucleotides. Because insertions and deletions typically have the same impact on the proteins they encode, uh, if it's happening within a gene, we refer to them collectively as indels. So we have point mutations and we have our indels, and those are gonna have different effects on proteins only if, however, those mutations occur within a protein encoding gene. And that's not always a given. 
So one of the things we know about the genomic architecture of many organisms is not every part of the chromosome encodes a protein encoding gene. In fact, the majority of it often doesn't. In bacteria, the majority of the chromosome, bacterial chromosomes are actually quite tight from a genomic perspective. In other words, there's not a lot of wasted space inside of a bacterial chromosome. Almost the entire part, entirety of a bacterial chromosome either encodes genes, protein encoding genes, or it counts for regulatory regions like promoters that regulate the expression of those genes. So chances are, if a mutation does happen within a bacterial chromosome, there are better odds that it's going to actually impact either the expression of a protein or change the way that protein is produced by changing the amino acid sequence. In eukaryotes, that's much less often the case. If we look at the human genome, for example, only 1% of the entire human genome actually includes protein encoding genes. The other 99% don't encode protein. What that means is even if you get a mutation, there's only on average a one in 100 chance that it could actually impact any one of the, any one of the genes that's actually within your genome that encodes a protein. There's a 99% chance it lands outside of it. And for that reason, the overwhelming majority of mutations are referred to as evolutionarily neutral because if they don't impact a protein or the expression of a protein, they're not likely to have a strong impact on whether or not that species or that individual who possesses that mutation is better or less adapted for the environment. But let's talk about what happens when a mutation does actually land within a protein encoding gene. If we're talking about a point mutation, there are lots of potential consequences. So first off, if the mutation lands within a protein encoding gene and alters a nucleotide in a way that does not change what that codon encodes, what amino acid that codon would encode, then it's referred to as a silent mutation. So one of the things you may recall from our video on translation, there are many different amino acids that have multiple codons that encode it. So for example, if we look at CCC, this is the codon that encodes the amino acid proline. If we have a mutation that changes that CCC codon to CCU, we're still going to get a proline amino acid. Same thing if we change it to CCA or CCG, we're still going to be getting proline as the amino acid that's inserted to the protein. Now, is it a mutation? It absolutely is because we have changed the DNA sequence within that gene. Does it have an impact on the protein? Most likely no, because we're still going to get a proline amino acid put into the protein which means it's probably not going to change the architecture of that protein, its structure, or its function. We can't know that without actually doing empirical experiments to determine that, but still, chances are no. So silent mutations do not result in the change of an amino acid sequence of a protein. But what if it does change what amino acid gets incorporated? Well, if we have a mutation within a gene that changes the type of amino acid that gets put in, that's called a missense mutation. So missense mutations are mutations that result in the change of the amino acid sequence of the protein. Do we know just by looking at that amino acid sequence or what amino acid gets replaced with another, do we know for certain that it's going to impact the structure of a pro or the impact the activity of a protein? We don't. We don't know that until we actually test the protein or more appropriately examine whether that particular change to the amino acid sequence affects the individual as a whole. But by getting a missense mutation, we do have a potential now to at least change the activity of that protein in a way that may or may not impact the evolutionary survival of the individual who possesses that mutation. The third possible result of a point mutation in the DNA is a nonsense mutation at the level of a protein. And a nonsense mutation is going to change a codon that encoded an amino acid and make it encode a nonsense codon. In other words, it's no longer going to encode for an amino acid. It's going to result in translational stop. So whatever happens, whatever amino acids are supposed to be downstream of that particular mutated codon now will no longer be incorporated into a protein. How much this impacts the protein depends on how far through the translational process we get this artificial stop codon. So if this is an 1,000 amino acid protein and this nonsense mutation occurs causing a stop at the 998th amino acid in the sequence, there's a much lesser chance of it impacting the protein than if it happened after amino acid 3, for example, and we truncate it uh, to make it a 
four amino acid protein as opposed to a 1,000 amino acid protein. But again, we don't know whether or not it will actually affect protein function without doing experiments to test that, nor can we tell whether or not that mutation one way or the other will impact the organism without examining it. The reason why we lump insertions and deletions together is, as indels is because they typically have the same consequence with respect to the proteins they encode. Whether you insert or you delete nucleotides from a gene, you're going to cause a frame shift mutation, more than likely. If you remember, again, from our conversation about translation, remember that that small ribosomal subunit is going to come with a methionine tRNA already loaded in it so that when the ribosome assembles, it will assemble right at the translational start site, start site the AUG codon for methionine. That sets the reading frame because the AUG, our nucleotides 1, 2, 3, are the first codon which means nucleotides four, five, and six are the second codon, and seven, eight, and nine are the third, and so on and so forth. Well, if you start inserting or deleting nucleotides from that DNA sequence, you're also going to insert or delete nucleotides from the mRNA. So all of a sudden, the entire reading frame for the way that mRNA is decoded is going to change. So if we insert nucleotides, now all of a sudden, what used to be the third codon becomes like the third and a half codon. In other words, we can shift the reading frame by one or two or more nucleotides depending on how many nucleotides we insert or delete. The end result is after that insertion or deletion, there will no longer be correct amino acids incorporated into the growing protein because the entire reading frame has been shifted. A great analogy for this would be to open up a book, go to the seventh page, find the letter T in the word the and delete it. I feel pretty confident that on pretty much every page of an, a book written in English will be the word the. If you delete the letter T from the word the, but instead of replacing it or leaving the same, you adjust by then just shifting every letter down one place. So now the first letter is H E and then to replace the third letter, you pick up the first letter of the word after it. Now all the words will be the exact same length, except for the last word, but all the words will be the exact same length, but none of them will make sense. And the same would be true as if you added an extra T into the word the on that page and just shifted everything down one to the right. So now the is TTH, and then the first, the, the, the first letter of the next word begins with an E. All of the words are the right length. None of them make any sense in the English language because you've shifted the reading frame. So that's what happens at the level of a protein. And again, frame shift mutations are much, much more likely to have an impact on that protein structure and thus that protein function than say uh, a missense mutation or a nonsense mutation because they're gonna ca cause large changes in the amino, amino acid composition of a protein. In fact, quite often they result in either premature stops or run on proteins uh, where there is no stop codon and eventually the MRJ just runs right off and you get whatever malformed protein is the result of that translational process. But regardless of the effect that a mutation has on a protein, if we're looking at it from an evolutionary standpoint, what we have to ask ourselves is, does it improve, harm, or leave the ability of the individual who possesses it? Does it, in, does it injure, harm, or improve, or not change their ability to survive and reproduce under their given environmental conditions? And that's the confusing part about evolution. Because you may have a mutation that completely destroys the ability of a protein to function or enhances the ability of a protein to function. But if it doesn't alter that individual's ability to survive to reproductive age and produce offspring, then from an evolutionary standpoint, it is considered to be neutral. And the overwhelming majority of mutations that occur in any organism within any species are evolutionarily neutral because either they won't land with inside a protein encoding gene if they do, they may not impact the ability of that protein to function or do its job. And even if they do impact that ability of that protein to do its job, it may not have any effect on the individual. A great example of this comes from humans. So when we change the DNA sequence of a protein encoding gene, we generate something called an allele. And alleles can change the phenotypic appearance of an organism. Great examples of neutral mutations in humans include things like your eye color or your hair color or whether you have attached earlobes or unattached earlobes, or whether you have a widow's peak, or how tall or how short you are. Overwhelmingly, no, none of those changes at the genetic level, 
have any impact on your ability to survive to reproductive age or produce viable offspring. So while they do change significantly your outward appearance, which we refer to as a phenotype, they're evolutionarily neutral because they don't benefit or harm you. Now, some mutations do have an impact on the survival and reproduction of the individuals who possess them. The overwhelming majority of those are actually harmful. Richard Dawkins is quite fond of saying that there are many more ways to get worse than there are to get better, especially when you're dealing with something as complex as a living thing. And that is 100% true. So of the small proportion of mutations that do actually impact the survival and reproduction of an individual, the majority of those are harmful, also called deleterious. But evolution and natural selection focuses on the very, 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 very small portion of mutations that are beneficial. And these are mutations that are going to enhance the ability of an organism to survive under their given environmental conditions. And that's the other thing to realize about the, the way we examine mutations. A neutral mutation can become beneficial under the right conditions. The same as a beneficial mutation can actually be harmful if conditions change one way or the other. When we talk about the survival of organisms in response to the mutations they possess, it's referred to as relative fitness because it's all relative depending on the environment that they're in. So beneficial mutations are mutations that enhance the ability of the individuals who possess them to survive and reproduce under the current conditions in which they exist. Beneficial mutations are the engines of evolution. They provide the genetic basis for natural selection to work on, to select for those individuals who are better adapted and better fit to reproduce in their environment. Now, while they are a very, very small component of the mutations that an individual can require, they might be the most important ones in terms of life on the planet Earth. And you can see just how fast beneficial mutations can accumulate in certain populations just by examining the current ongoing crisis involving antibiotic resistance. The majority of mutations that lead to antibiotic resistance have always existed within those pathogenic species that cause harm to us. But for the thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of years that they've existed within those populations, they've been evolutionarily neutral. But all of a sudden, now that we're starting to use antibiotics over the last 70 or 80 years to treat infections caused by these bacteria, what we've been doing is we have been selecting for those individuals who are more resistant to the antibiotics that we use. And over time, we gradually kill off those members of the population with little to no resistance, thereby enhancing those populations for those individuals who are at least partially or totally resistant to the antibiotics that we use. And as a result, those are the only individuals within the population that can reproduce and pass their genetic information on to the next generation. And over time, all we are doing is gradually increasing the ability of these, these bacteria to be resistant to antibiotics simply by selecting against those that don't have the mutations that make them resistant and selecting in favor of those that do have mutations that make them resistant. And that's the power of mutations. That's the power of evolution driven by the random mutations that occur within all species over a given period of time. The last thing I want to talk about with respect to mutations is that mutations can also help us track evolutionary relatedness between species. So one of the things to think about is we are all related to each, all species are related to each other in one way or another. And that's because of evolutionary divergence. Over enough time, if a species acquires enough mutations, they can actually diverge and become a new separate species from the one in which they originated. And that's how all of life has evolved over the last 3.8 billion years or so. But what's really neat is if you understand that, then what you can understand then is that species who are more closely related from an evolutionary perspective have similar genomes. In other words, they're going to include more of the same genetic mutations than species who are less closely related. And being able to investigate the genomic composition of several different species or of virtually any species on the planet at this point has led to some pretty surprising discoveries. So let's look just as an example of this of four things that we might find in an ocean at any given time. Let's look at a shark, uh, a, a grouper, which is a big ray fin fish, a coelacanth, which is a lobe fin fish that we once thought was completely extinct until it was rediscovered off the coast of Africa, and a human being uh, that's diving in the ocean at said time. 
So let's explore the evolutionary relationships, and what we might find is quite surprising. So let's look at, for, start with the grouper and the coelacanth and the human being. Now you may look at the coelacanth and the grouper and say, hey, uh, those two species are very closely related. In fact, they must be much more closely related to each other than either one of them is to the human being. And you would be absolutely wrong because the coelacanth is actually more closely related to the human being than it is to the grouper. And the reason for this is coelacanths are actually lobe finned fish. And if you were to peel back the skin on their lobe fins, what you would see is essentially the skeletal blueprint of the human hand. Lobe finned fish and the coelacanth included are the descendants of the earliest tetrapods. And at the, even at the genomic level, that is reflected. If you look at the genomes of a coelacanth and compare it to that of a human being, they'll be much more similar than they would to the grouper. Now let's take that shark and the grouper and the coelacanth and put them next to each other. And you might think, well, you know, well, if the coelacanth is that closely related to humans, then the grouper must be more related to the shark than it is to the coelacanth. And there again, you would be wrong because the grouper is more closely related to the coelacanth because they are bony fish. They are part of the osteichthyes group of bony fish. They produce true bones. On the other hand, the shark is a chondrichthys. They are cartilaginous fish. They don't have any ability to make bones. They don't have the genomic information to do that. So the one thing I want to point out that's really cool about being able to track mutations throughout evolutionary history is it can show us the evolutionary path that many species have taken. It can show us who our closest relatives are and who our more distant relatives are simply by looking at the different mutations that we have and comparing to them, them to the mutations that other species have, which I think is really, really cool. As I said before, mistakes happen. And when mistakes happen in DNA, we call those mutations. And mutations, although they are mistakes, aren't always bad. They are the engines of evolution and they provide genetic diversity. Remember, even though mutations happen only in the DNA, because DNA is what encodes the, is the source code for life and encodes all the information needed to make life possible, if we change the DNA sequence of an organism, we might then affect the proteins that make up that organism's cells and thus impact the ability of that individual to survive and reproduce in their environment. That's how DNA mutations Little mistakes that occur through replication and exposure to chemicals drive evolution. Thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you learned a lot today and I will talk to you soon.